Hi, I'm Jonathan Burke, Professor of Finance at the Graduate School of Business at Stanford University. And I'm Jules van Binsbergen, a finance professor at the Wharton School of the University of Pennsylvania. And this is the All Else Equal podcast. Welcome back, everybody. Today, we're going to talk about a key issue that many decision makers face. In particular, we're going to talk about causality. That is, when do you know that something has caused something else rather than something just being correlated with something else? For example, let's assume you own a cycle bar franchise and you notice that after Starbucks opened next door, your sales and usage went up. So the question is, did Starbucks increase your sales? Did the fact that Starbucks opened next to you cause more people to come into your front door? That's an important question, because if it did, you should then locate near Starbucks. question is, how can you determine that? Well, so we have to consider a bunch of different possibilities. The first one is the one you just said, which is, yes, Starbucks opening next to you causes your sales to increase. Second, there could be a common factor that both increases your sales as well as causes Starbucks to open the store next to you. For example, suppose that the business cycle is at a very good point, the economy is booming, that is driving your sales up, and that is also leading Starbucks to open stores all over the place, including just next to you. The third possibility is what we call reverse causality. Suppose that Starbucks realizes that you are going to have a lot of growth, you are going to be the hottest thing in town, and therefore they decide intentionally to open the Starbucks store next to you because they see this growth coming. And so it's really your growth that is causing Starbucks to come next to you, as opposed to the other way around, where Starbucks opening the store is causing your growth. And then the final possibility is it's all just random. It's just pure chance. For this episode, let's just assume that you know that this isn't a random occurrence. Say you have lots of different franchises. Some of them have Starbucks and others do not. And you notice that everyone that has a Starbucks, you see an increase. So then we still need to figure out these other possibilities. And so to learn a little more about what these other possibilities are and how they work, let's do a couple of examples where it's very clear that one of the other things was going on. So for example, take Muncie, Indiana which by a lot of pollsters is being used as a good predictor of what the election outcome in a general election is going to be. Now, suppose that there is a politician who thinks, you know what, given the fact that the outcome in Muncie, the outcome of the poll is very predictive of who wins the election, I'm going to spend all of my resources campaigning in Muncie because as long as I convince Muncie to vote for me, I will win the general election. So obviously that is a common factor that strategy isn't going to work. The reason Muncie is such a good predictor of the general election is that the people who live in Muncie are a good representative sample of all Americans. And so you spending money in Muncie isn't going to change the general election. So it's a good example of where Muncie isn't causing the general election. It's a common factor. Another example that I think is very illustrative of reverse causality is there's this famous story about 19th century Southern Russia where cholera was going around And a lot of people were dying from it. And when the doctors showed up, people in the villages saw that every time the doctors showed up, there were a lot of people suffering from cholera and dying from cholera. So the story goes that the villagers started to chase away the doctors from their villages, in some cases even killed them, because they were under the impression that the doctors were in fact causing the cholera. Whereas, of course, the reverse causality was true, which was the places where there were the most patients were the places where the doctors would go to. Reverse causality is one of those things that when you're in the moment just seems so unintuitive and you really have to think that through. So the question now is, how can you tell? Let's go back to our example with the Starbucks and the cycle bar. Suppose we could just design the perfect experiment to figure this out. One experiment that we could set up is, why don't we just look at 100 different places where there are cycle bars, and we're going to randomly select 50 of them where we're going to open a Starbucks. Now, it's very important that this selection truly is done by lottery, and there's no influence whatsoever from how we pick where the Starbucks is going to be opened. And what we're then going to do is simply this. 
We're going to look at the 50 locations where the Starbucks was open. Then we look at the sales growth of Cycle Bar. And we look at the 50 locations where no Starbucks was opened, which is what we call the control group. The place where the Starbucks was opened, those places we call the treatment group. And then we're going to compare the sales growth of both the treatment group to that of the control group. We do before and after between the two groups. And therefore, we call this sometimes a difference in differences approach because we're taking the difference before and after between the treatment and the control group. And if we then see in that experiment that there is an effect, then we can safely draw the conclusion that the opening of Starbucks, in fact, caused the sales growth to increase. In the industry, often this is called A-B testing. And as you can see, it's critically important that the assignment of the treatment and the control group is purely random. If that assignment is truly random, then it means that there are no other factors affecting those two groups. And so the if you see a difference, the only possible explanation is causality, what you're testing for. The truly random assignment between the two groups is the most important part of that experiment. It's also, unfortunately, the reason why it's impractical. In most cases, you don't have the ability to randomly assign. You don't get to decide where Starbucks open stores. And so now we have a problem. In the real world, how can we tell if we can't randomly assign? What has happened, particularly in the field of economics, but in many other places too, is that the talent of the researcher is really to try to come up with what's called quasi-random variation. Variation that happens in the world already without having to explicitly set up this experiment and try to use that part of the variation that we think is random to still do a quasi-experiment and still do something similar, which is to try to compare before and after between two groups, the groups that was more or less affected by this quasi-random variation, and try to figure out what the size of the effect is. So the idea is there's a lot of variation in the world, and why don't we use existing variation to assign to the treatment and control? But obviously, this can lead to a lot of problems because you have to be certain that the existing variation is truly random. So let me give you an example. Let's say it's in Starbucks' interest to locate on a corner. And so sales for Starbucks on corners and non-on corners are different. But from your perspective, whether you're on a corner is irrelevant. So then well, what's going to happen is Starbucks are going to preferentially locate on corners. And so what you can do is you can look at whether or not you are next to a corner as quasi-random variation. So as long as whether you or not on a corner doesn't affect your sales, then Starbucks will randomly select a corner to open on. And when you're not next to a corner, they won't open just because you're not next to a corner. And you can use that variation to distinguish between whether it's Starbucks causing the increase in sales or something else. But as you can see, the key assumption there is that locating on a corner doesn't affect you, which often in the real world is probably not a very accurate assumption, because of course, corners get more traffic. This is exactly what economics researchers then constantly quibble about, right? Because we don't have this utopian situation of the perfect experiment, we have to go to the second best, but the second best is the second best, which means it's not ideal, which means there are reasons that you can criticize it for. So Jules, before we invite our guests on the show, the one thing we be nice to do is to describe what we consider one of the cleverest uses of naturally occurring random variation to understand an economic question. And the economic question was this, do family firms do worse when the patriarch or the matriarch dies and passes it along to their children? Now, certainly in the data and anecdotally, there's general agreement, yes, firms that are passed on to their kids when there's nepotism do worse. And it would seem like that is enough to show, yes, nepotism is bad and family patriarchs and matriarchs should not pass the firm onto their kids. Instead, they should sell the firm. But the problem with that is, think about the selection. If I'm a patriarch and I have started a family firm and it's now my time to retire, perhaps the first thing I do is try to sell the firm. And if my firm's good, it's easy to sell. And my firm's bad, I can't sell it. And so what I do is I pass it on to my kids. And so then afterwards, you would find that the firms that were passed on to kids were worse, but not because the kids screwed it up. It's because they were worse in the first place. 
And the question is, can you design a quasi-random experiment that could differentiate between those two explanations? And one of our former colleagues at the Stanford GSB, Francisco Perez-Gonzalez, had a very smart idea of solving this issue. Because what he came up with was the idea that the probability that you pass on the firm to your kids is actually determined by truly random variation. And what is that random variation? It is whether or not the firstborn child is a boy. So if the firstborn child is a boy, then the patriarch or the matriarch is much more likely to pass on the firm to that child. And if the firstborn is a girl, then it turns out that they're less likely to do that. And because of that random variation, we can now essentially run the experiment anyway, because we have a treatment and a control group that we can use to figure out whether or not passing the firm to your children is in fact a good or a bad business decision. And so what did Francisco find? Well, he found that firms where the firstborn child was a girl did better. And that was clear evidence that it's the kids that are screwing the firm up. Because think about it. The child was born 30 years before the decision to pass the firm on. And so it's pretty inconceivable to think that the sex of your firstborn child is in any way predictive of the quality of the firm. And so the two firms, whether your firstborn is a girl or a boy or otherwise identical, we find a difference. The only reason there could be a difference then has to do with the decision of the patriarch to pass the firm along. And because firms with a firstborn is a boy do worse, it indicates that decision to pass the firm on was detrimental for the firm. That is, nepotism is bad. Indeed. So let's summarize. So the question the researchers were trying to address is whether or not matriarchs and patriarchs passing on the firm to their children is a good thing or a bad thing from the perspective of value creation. And so by using this variation of the firstborn child that happens to be correlated with whether or not the firm is passed on because matriarchs and patriarchs are more likely to pass on the firm to boys rather than to girls, you can see in the data that matriarchs and patriarchs for which the firstborn is a girl, those firms tend to do better. And the reason for that is, is that they're less likely to pass on the firm to their children, are more likely to sell it off to outsiders who do more with the firm than what their own children would have done. And we always think about a wonderful example of using natural variation to design a good A-B test that can determine causality. So I think this is a good time for us to introduce our guest. It's Guido Imbens, who's the Applied Economics Professor at the GSB at Stanford University and a colleague of mine, most famously known for winning the 2021 Nobel Prize in the area of causality, what we're talking about today, how you determine whether something, a piece of evidence has a causal relationship. Guido, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me. Thanks so much for being with us, Guido. So as a first question, why do you think is it so difficult for people to tell correlation and causation apart? Why do we see so often that people seem to confuse the two? Obviously, there's a lot of cases where people are very aware that there's a difference between causality and correlation. There's some of these standard examples, right? There being a positive correlation between ice cream sales and shark attacks. And so people are clear that's not really causal. But then there's a lot of other cases where people have strong priors that particular correlations probably are causal. One nice example is what my colleague, Josh Angris, studied the relationship between schools and earnings. And he found that there's a strong correlation between going to a more selective school and earnings, but that a lot of that is not causal. And he did a, these very nice studies where he looked at people just at the margin of getting admitted to these more selected schools. And he found actually that the people who got into these selected schools actually did slightly worse than the people who didn't get admitted. And of course, all the parents and all the students are trying very hard to get into these selected schools, and it may actually not be a good thing from a causal perspective for them individually. Just to elaborate on that, basically, smart students get into good schools. And so you're trying to separate the difference between the student being smart and being able to get along with, in life very well anyway, 
and the effect of the schools. Yeah. And what he did was he looked at students who just didn't get in and ones that just got in. So they're very closely related in terms of smarts, but unrelated in terms of getting in and not getting in and found out that if you didn't get in, you actually did better. And if you didn't get in, maybe you thought to yourself, I'm going to show them that I can do this. And there's a motivating effect from just not getting in. Whereas the people that did get in maybe took a little bit of a more relaxed approach to education because they thought they already made it by getting in. So there's this effort component that may play a role there too, right? Yeah, there's a bunch of different things playing a role. Obviously, it may have some effect being at the bottom of your class and kind of realizing you're not quite as smart as you thought you were. Yep. And maybe there's a boost from being at the top of the class that may motivate you to do well. But the bottom line is that in the end for these individuals, scoring a little higher and then getting into these more selective schools and pretty much everybody who got into these more selective schools did in fact go there. The bottom line is that that may not actually have helped them, that they may have been better off scoring a little lower and being forced to go to these less selective schools. And that's clearly a case where everybody viewed the correlation initially as causal, even though that may not be the case. And people were partly confused by the fact that you did see a positive correlation between going to the selective school or not, because on average, people were smarter there, but that's separate from the causal effect. Of course, at the business school, we're never quite sure either whether the fact that people who go to business schools make more money than people who don't, how much of that is actually causal from what we teach them versus how much of that is them already being smart when they come in. So, Guido, as you started out the podcast, you made this point that when people see causal relationships because it seems so obvious that there must be a causal relationship and we started with what i think is an excellent example but in business this happens all the time how do you think the developments economics has made in understanding how to really test for causality which you obviously contributed enormously to how do you think that is helpful for people making business decisions well i mean Think about settings so where we need to estimate demand functions, where we need to estimate price elasticities. We need to know how much the sales would actually change if we increased or lowered prices. And if you just look at simple correlations over time between prices and sales, that's clearly very misleading. If you look just at a very specific product, say children's toys, prices are high just before Christmas and sales are high too. So if you look at the overall correlation, it may be close to zero. In fact, it may be positive, but nobody thinks that increasing prices would actually increase sales. But for the businesses, just knowing that sales will probably go down if you increase prices is not enough. You actually need to know by how much. And so you need to really disentangle the correlation and causation there. You need to really try to estimate what the effect of a price increase is would be. And that's kind of where a lot of these methods come in. You need to work with some of the natural variation in prices. The, often the price changes are discrete. So you can compare sales just before and just after price changes. And sometimes there's shocks to prices unrelated to demand coming from supply shocks. So there's a lot of economics that goes into trying to help businesses disentangle correlation and causation in that type of uh, setting. So Guido, one thing that business decision makers could do is just like we try to do when we write our research papers is to try to run controlled experiments for particular business questions that they have. Now, would you think that it's a good idea for them to go after this themselves and do this and set it up? And if so, how do you get a grasp of the cost-benefit analysis of whether that decision of running such an experiment is actually a good business decision? Is it worth the benefits relative to the costs that it costs to run such an experiment? And so in general, I think you want to see running an experiment as just another business decision. So suppose you're trying to figure out whether a particular advertising campaign is a good idea, or this is an example that Steve Tadad has looked at, but it makes sense for eBay to advertise on the Google search platform. Whether you're going to do that or not is a decision you're going to have to make one way or the other. And doing an experiment is really just an investment where you buy some information in order to improve your decision-making. 
it's not that an experiment is going to give you exactly the right answer what the effect of the business decision is going to be, but it's going to give you better information so that on average you're going to make a better decision. And so you should look in that case at what is the cost of actually doing the experiment. It's going to take some time. It's going to possibly cost you some customers if you expose them to something that they don't uh, want. So there's a lot of costs that go into that. And then there's some benefits. At the end of the day, you're going to have some information that you wouldn't have otherwise, that you wouldn't have in the absence of the experiment. And hopefully that information is going to make you make better decisions. But really, you should start kind of about what you think about the effect you're interested in. If you already know what the effect is, there's no reason to do an experiment. But if you don't know what the effect is, and it would be very valuable to know, then maybe doing an experiment is going to help. It's going to be worth it. And if there's a lot of decisions for which that type of information is very helpful, then in fact, it may be worth setting up a platform where you can do experiments more regularly and do them more effectively. And that's what you see a lot of the big tech companies doing, where they're running these experiments very routinely. But of course, it's much harder for small businesses. But again, the stakes are often much, much higher too, where there's really big improvements possible. And initially, you may not have a lot of information to base those decisions on. So Guido, talking about that random experiments can be very costly, we also spoke about in the introduction the idea of using naturally occurring randomness to try to tease out causality. Do you have any examples in your own experience of where a naturally occurring randomness has been used by a business to infer causality? One example I mentioned already that is for estimating demand functions, often the firms exploit the fact that price changes are discrete. So you can compare what's happening just before and just after price changes to look at what the effect of prices on demand is. Another setting is changes in tax regulations. When California changed the way they taxed internet sales, they gave a lot of these companies a great opportunity to figure out what the effect was of implicit price changes for the customers on sales. And so even though that wasn't a proper experiment, it still allowed them to get credible estimates of causal effects that are very helpful for thinking about strategies in other states and other locations. The whole idea of using this random variation actually has quite a long history going far back. The first ones, I think, even go back to the 1920s. But interestingly, I think those papers had that in the appendix of some paper. And it wasn't even, I'm not even sure that people at the time realized or recognized how important those breakthroughs were. Is that fair? Yeah. In fact, it goes back to the 1900s when John Snow tried to figure out where the cholera epidemic was coming from. And he figured out that a lot of people who died were getting their drinking water from the same pump as other people who died. And the people in the next neighborhood who were getting their drinking water from somewhere else were surviving at much higher rates. And he realized it was connected to the water that people were drinking. So these natural experiments have a long history. And it's really in the 80s and 90s that people, the econometricians became more aware of how important it is and how you can formalize how the big an effect that it has on the credibility of these estimates and to look more systematically for places where these natural experiments occur. The economic research that was done before the 80s, do you think that people were just sloppier in communicating it? Or do you think that people were communicating generally that there was an issue and disentangling causality and correlation was hard, but we just had to be careful with interpreting it? Because it seems that isn't one of the key purposes of research that we try to establish causal relationships. So you might wonder, without those, how valuable is the research really? Initially, in the 1920s, 1930s, there were a couple of really clever studies that still resonate with me a lot. But I think over time, people got a little sloppy and they started making these models without really being very clear where the information was coming from that allowed you to estimate these effects. And there's this famous paper by Ed Lima, kind of where he talks about nobody believing anybody else's empirical work. And there was some truth to that, that by the mid 80s, when Lima was writing his paper, there was a lot of empirical work. It was actually, there was a lot of data available already, but there was a lot of empirical work that really wasn't very clear. That wasn't really very convincing. 
Lima gives this example of people studying the effect of the death penalty on deterrence of murders. And you know, some papers came up with very big positive effects. Some papers came up with very big negative effects. And they're all very precisely estimated according to these papers. But it was clear that as a body of work, they couldn't possibly all be right. And really, if you look at them now, it's clear that the strategies people were using to get at those estimates were just not very credible. And that, that some of these questions are just really hard to answer. And as a result, there was a lot more variation in the quality of the empirical work than I see nowadays. So one of our other guests, we asked him a similar question and a related question, which was clearly the amount of available data has grown enormously and the tools in principle have become much better. But the impression of our other guests was that didn't necessarily mean that the average quality of the research has improved. Would you disagree with that statement? Would you think that due to the new techniques and the more available data, we're actually doing much better today than we did, say, 20 years ago? Well, maybe going back a little further, I mean, compared to the level of the quality of the work in the 1980s and before, yes, I think overall the quality of empirical work has vastly improved. But I think that came in stages. First, a lot more data became available. People started playing around with all that data but not necessarily being very careful in what they were doing. And then I think some of the methods caught up. And now I think the practice, you know, it's not perfect, but I think the practice is much better than what it was 40 years ago. I think the lesson for our listeners about business decision-making is how easy it is to conclude a causal relationship when there isn't a causal relationship. How much better have business decision-makers gotten at this, do you think? Oh, again, they've gotten much better. Even when they're not doing experiments, a lot of the decision makers are now very aware that ideally they would be doing experiments and they think about what the experiments would be like. And so it's much easier to talk to them about what the data can actually tell you and what it can't tell you. Where before they might have been much more willing to take observational studies at face value and believe the results from there without having the understanding without having the tools to really question where those results came from and how credible they are. That's something I've seen at a bunch of these companies I've talked to. It's really where the, the economics of decision-making and the settings come in, where just having computer scientists or statisticians is, is not necessarily quite enough. You really need to understand the incentives and the biases that come with the observational studies. Well, thank you very much, Guido. That was great. Thank you very much for having me. Great to see you guys. Same here. Thanks for listening to the All Else Equal podcast. Please leave us a review at Apple Podcasts. We love to hear from our listeners. And be sure to catch our next episode by subscribing or following our show wherever you listen to your podcasts. For more information and episodes, visit allelseequalpodcast.com or follow us on LinkedIn. The All Else Equal podcast is a production of Stanford University's Graduate School of Business and is produced by University FM.